<laughs> we felt as though we had the Davers here, so thank you if you're not one of them for certainly bringing them in. <laughs> so wonderful. So, as I um, mentioned in the beginning, I wanted to talk a little bit about equanimity today, and equanimity is a very lofty state of mind. So sometimes it's difficult to talk about or understand and relate to because it can be seen as one of the Brahma Viharas, but it's Brahma Vihara number four. <laughs> so also this can be equated almost to the fourth jhana, which is a state of extreme stillness, if you can use the word extreme. And um, something that I think involves quite a mature practice. However, it's also the last of the enlightenment factors, the seven enlightenment factors. So equanimity follows from mindfulness and investigation, dhamma vichaya, and energy that uh, arises when we investigate our body and minds. And then piti, which is rapture, and pasadi, I think, is it pasadi in the enlightenment factors? And then samadhi, followed by equanimity. So again, suggesting that equanimity is an even deeper state of samadhi. And also, of course, the outcome of deep wisdom that's able to um, understand that everything in this universe arises and passes. And I think this is one of the differences between the Buddha's teachings and many of the other uh, great world religions that the Buddha is saying everything is subject to arising and passing away by its nature, whether we like that or not. And so developing equanimity is like a huge container in which we can allow nature to unfold in a sense. And um, I wanted to talk about how we can cultivate it because it is obviously such a, a lofty quality and also give you a bit of inspiration as to um, what we're aiming for. So there's a lot. How was your equanimity? It's fine. Thanks. I don't want to use the water. Right. That's good, that's good. Not the water. <laughs> so this little quote is from the Anguttara Nikaya, and it's, I don't know how many people are really into the suttas here, um, but if you're not yet, Hopefully, it will be by the end of this <laughs> session. So, um, this is from the Anguttara Nikaya number 655, and it's addressed to Sona. And here the Buddha says If one is liberated, even if powerful forms, sounds, odors, tactile objects, in other words, um, physical objects, and um, I mm, don't know what that says. Sights, I guess. No, form sounds, odors, tactile objects, and I think objects cognizable by the mind come in contact with uh, their respective organs. So whatever we experience, in other words, through the six senses, whatever arises, even if they're powerful, even if they're intense and coarse, and this includes really unwanted things, right? They do not obsess one's mind. The mind is not at all affected. It remains steady, attained to imperturbability, and one observes its vanishing. Just as a violent storm coming from all directions could not make a solid mountain move, could not make the mountain quake, wobble, or tremble, so the mind remains steady. How about that? Would you like to be that mountain? <laughs> it's something I often think my teacher represents because he's so solid. It's like a rock. You know, you come to him with whatever's going on for you, whether it's positive or negative in your mind, and he remains unworried, unruffled, and says, I'm not worried about you which is genuine because his mind is so vast. And I think all of us have experienced the mind being smaller, being more contracted and brittle, and the mind when it's more expansive, when it's wider, when it's more resourced. And I think this is an important point in the cultivation of equanimity as part of our daily practice and our dealings in life. We need to develop the kind of equanimity that's true equanimity, 
not to be confused with a sort of passivity or a kind of cool aloofness or even a, a sort of apathy. Well, there's nothing I can do, so therefore I should just you know, let go, stand back, allow injustices to keep on happening. This is not the true equanimity. The real equanimity comes as a result, as we've said, of wisdom and also of the other Brahma Viharas. So to me, it's like a culmination of all those Brahma Viharas. It already has that metta imbued within it, the karuna, the mudita, and then the equanimity that understands no matter how we respond to the world, how much love, how much compassion we put in there, and we should, and this is our responsibility, still, a lot of the, what's going to unfold is beyond our control. You know, people and life unfolds according to its karma, according to effects that were already planted, seeds that were already planted. But we can affect the way those seeds um, sprout by the quality of our mind in the present moment. And of course, we can always develop the karma in this present moment, which is the way that we respond to life and to situations. So developing this equanimity in daily life helps to build our mindfulness and our wisdom. And it's informed by those things too. And it also helps to balance the cultivation of the four Brahma Viharas. So recently, as I mentioned in the beginning, I was teaching a meta retreat. In fact, everything has felt like a spin since then because it only just ended. And some of you are here from that retreat with big smiles on your face. Phew, <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> and one of the things that became obvious there is just the depth of practice and emotional agility that meta really requires because it's so easy for loving kindness to slip into something close but almost um, tinged with its obstacles, with its hindrances. And some of those can be so, so close. For example, one um, person said that when they say, may I be happy, it slips into a kind of begging or a pleading, may I be happy or may this person be well. And this is our attachments coming in. This is our sense of clinging and wanting a certain outcome of that loving kindness practice. And so this is an example of a situation where equanimity is very helpful, that we give our best, but in the end, that's all we can do. And we don't know whether that metta is going to sprout and flourish in our heart. Sometimes the feeling doesn't arise. We don't know when it may. It may have already arisen for some people after the retreat if you weren't getting it during that time. But also, we don't know whether it's really going to help another being, no matter how much we you know, generate loving thoughts. And in a sense, it's better not to know because it keeps it unconditional. We're not practicing loving kindness to change others. We're practicing loving kindness to incline our own mind in the wholesome direction of love and to trust the process that if we continually incline in that way, eventually our minds will lean towards loving kindness and will experience loving kindness now as an object of the mind. So the Buddha always said that, uh, well, he said it once, but I think this was a law of nature. But, uh, and who knows, he might have said this to many people, but luckily it's preserved. In um, the Majjhima Nikaya number 19, the two types of thought, and he says, whatever we frequently reflect and ponder upon becomes the inclination of our mind. And there he's encouraging us to relate to the world with loving kindness, to have thoughts of loving kindness, thoughts of non-harm, non-ill will, non-cruelty, which in other words means being very gentle, being very compassionate with ourselves and with our mental and emotional world, and also thoughts of... Um, letting go, if you like. I mean, actually, the word is renunciation, which has got a really bad rap. I'm sure that Bhante <laughs> Ajahn uh, Nisabo and Ajahn Kavilo and all the Sangha here are giving it a much better um, reputation. <laughs> but, uh, you know, renunciation isn't something brittle or dry. It's not a loss in any way. It's actually letting go of a lesser happiness for the sake of something much more sublime. And so letting go can also be related to giving um, and to non-control, non-possession. So in other words, not having that agenda on our lives, you know, not 
expecting instant results, but having the patience for things to work themselves out, having that trust, and allowing the Dhamma to unfold. And of course, equanimity is a part of all of this. It goes together hand in hand with these beautiful attitudes, and this can be a way that we relate to the sixth sense world. So I wanted to talk about the six senses as a, another way to develop equanimity because essentially they are our world. They are how we experience the world. But if you think about your experience, you can always break it down into one of those senses. So in a sense, they comprise our whole world. And I think it's the Indriya Samyutta in the Samyutta Nikaya where the Buddha says they are the all, the word sabba, all. In other words, there's nothing beyond those six senses that is in our experience, in, our, um, in what we understand as the world. So it's very important to understand how these senses work and also really helpful to break them down into separate senses so that you can start to analyze what you understand as good, bad, <laughs> wanted, unwanted situations because most of the time, if not all of the time, we're reacting to one or more of these sense impressions. So I wanted to talk about what exactly they are and how they arise, first of all, because of course we have to live in this world. It's not about um, avoiding sense contact. It's certainly not about destroying the senses <laughs> in order not to suffer because you know they are also our gateway and vehicle to liberation. So we have to learn to handle them skillfully, and it's helpful to know exactly what they are. So what are the six sense bases, and how do they arise? And really, we can divide them into two or three. So on the one hand, we have the internal sense bases, and that really means the organs, apart from the mind, perhaps, but the organs of um, a sense consciousness. So eye, ear nose. These are the internal sense organs that we have. And then we have the external sense organs or sense objects, rather, which are the forms that come in contact with the eye and the sights, of course. Sorry, that's the saying, the sights. And the sounds that come in contact with the ear, the flavors, you know, food or edibles, consumables that come in contact with the tongue. And I think you can pretty much work out the rest, right? Tactile objects that come in contact with the body sense door. And for the mind, it's basically all of those objects that the mind remembers and also thoughts. So you'll probably notice that whenever you have a thought, it's about one of those five senses. It's about, um, or it can also be about the mind itself, but it's usually about you know, the things you've tasted, the people that you want to see, that you want to talk to, you want them to say certain words to you and not other words, hopefully. Like, oh God, not you again, you know. And you want to hope, even as a monastic, that the alms food will be suitable for your tummy and leave you satisfied so that you can continue to practice your meditation. So most of our mind is consumed by these things. And um, it's when those two come in contact so the eye comes in contact with a form, and that's called passa, contact, that eye consciousness arises. In other words, seeing. Yeah? Eye consciousness is seeing, and that's a kind of activity. And it's really nice to be seeing all of you, I have to say. Um, but one of the things we can do here is to notice, of course, our relationship with the visual forms, and also notice how that's changing all the time. You know, we can't only get the forms that we want to see. Sometimes there'll be forms we don't want to see. We can't only stay around the people we love. Sometimes we'll be um, disassociated with the loved and we'll be in contact with those who are not dear to us. Sometimes even those who, you know, have caused significant harm. So if we're trying to control that world simply through um, trying to avoid and be in contact with the liked, then this isn't going to work. So what do we actually do? <laughs> because that con consciousness is contingent on those two coming together. And as long as we have these sense faculties, then there's going to be conscious experience. And the Buddha actually said that the nature of conscious experience is to burn. 
it's to burn. This was in the fire sermon, one of, I think the third sermon that he gave after his liberation. He basically said the I and the forms and the I consciousness, as well as the subsequent feeling that arises, because whenever these come into contact, there's a feeling that arises. There's a certain feeling that arises when we see. There's a certain feeling that arises when something touches us. If it's cold, then we have a feeling that we call cold or freezing or shivering, right? If we have um, a loving hug, then that's a certain type of feeling. It's maybe soft or warm. So feeling arises and we respond or react to that. And the Buddha said that all of these things are burning. Burning with what? Burning with greed, with hatred, and with delusion. Delusion is the root um, cause of suffering. You know, it's not seeing things clearly. It's the opposite of wisdom. So we don't understand um, the nature of these things. And as a result, we crave, we, um, we react with greed or with hate. And also, he said that they're burning with old age, sickness, and death with sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair, which is exactly the same definition as given for suffering, right, in the Dhamma Chakra Sutta, the first after the Buddha awakened to the truth. So these six senses are critical to understand because they are essentially the way we experience life and the world and ourselves and other people. So what do we do about that? <laughs> and one of the things that's um, often undertaught as part of the Buddhist path is um, called sense restraint. That's the English translation for Indriya Sambhara Sila. It's an aspect of Sila and it's part of the gradual training. So in the gradual training, which is one of the most frequently taught um, practices basically, and it encompasses, it encompasses the whole Eightfold Path, um, we start with having confidence in the Buddha's teachings. And that confidence encourages us to start to put, in, put them into practice through the practice of sila. Yeah. Does everybody know sila? I'm sure you do. It's the practice of virtue. But it's not only the don'ts. It's also the positive aspects of virtue, which includes using our body and speech in wholesome ways to bring about more happiness for ourselves and others. And this is a wholesome happiness that the Buddha called anavajasukha. It means blameless bliss because it's wholesome. It's based on harm, harmlessness. It's not based on sensual desire. And so that virtue in the very beginning is the start of the path, really. And it's the first time that we start to restrain the way we use our senses, at least the way we act upon whatever comes into contact with those senses by having a little bit of um, care and kindness and an attitude of wishing to lessen harm for ourselves and other beings. But that sila actually has a mental aspect, which is what the Buddha meant by indriya samvara sila. And it's the, um, the kind of mental sila, if you like, like the um, inner virtue of the mind. It's the way that we use our mind in attending to objects that come in contact with our senses. I hope this is not too technical. Good. <laughs> because this is something that's going on all the time. And so much of the time we're caught up in what's going on outside and trying to take care of our actions outside, which is very essential, very beautiful. But when we go a bit deeper as meditators, and we can do this in our daily life, we can actually see how we're using our mind in the first place, that gives rise to those um, actions of body and speech. So here, we're actually learning to guard the senses. This is what the Buddha meant by um, the sealer of the mind. It's called sense restraint, or sometimes guarding or governing the senses. And the basic principle is that when an object comes into mind, comes to our mind, we have to notice our relationship with that and use our attention in a way that increases the wholesome qualities and decreases any chance of the unwholesome qualities arising in that space. Again, it's that space between the mind and its object. And we can either have these cravings and aversions and delusion, which causes those senses to burn, yeah, to be on fire, 
or we can put these beautiful qualities there. And sometimes there's a bit of skill to this because we can actually train the way we think about what happens to us in a wholesome way. So one example would be if you see a person that you don't like very much and you know you don't like them and you know you have to meet them. <laughs> so you might want to prime yourself for that and actually use your attention, your perception in a way that focuses on the good in them instead of focusing on the faults. And this is what my teacher Adrian Brown calls seeing the 998 good bricks. Okay, you might say, well, there's not always 998. That would be easy, right? What if there's only one? And then there's other suttas for that that say you have to very gently approach that person and just actually cup your hands and drink from as if drinking from a small puddle. In other words, you take in any bit of goodness you possibly can to keep your mind cool, to keep those defilements from arising. And I think we can take it further than that. We can actually engage with those good qualities in that person and encourage them you know, by engaging maybe with their beautiful speech. Even if they don't always do the right thing, you can talk to them in pleasant ways and you know, notice if they're polite and encourage that. Yeah? It's the same thing with ourselves. Sometimes we are the disliked person. And this was a very common um, comment on the Metta retreat, that what if we are that person, you know, that we don't like very much? And unfortunately, one of the biggest obstacles to the practice of loving kindness is a kind of um, self-berating or self-criticism or even self-sabotaging attitudes and thoughts that have been conditioned into us by our upbringing, by our society, or whatever it is, you know. If your parents talk to themselves that way, then they probably might talk to you that way, which means that you'll start talking to yourself that way, right? And this can go back for generations. We don't even know. But what we can do when we have a degree of sense restraint is to notice the way we're speaking to ourselves and to notice whether this is for my harm or for my good and just gently try to turn that inner dialogue around to something a lot more constructive and encouraging and gentle. You know, giving ourselves the benefit of the doubt. One lovely uh, way I like to look at it is, you know, in meditation people are often, unfortunately, I hope this doesn't happen here, comparing, <laughs> taking notes, you know. Oh, what did you experience? Oh, really? I didn't get any peace. You got that much peace? You saw a light in your meditation? I never see a light. You know, and then in some places, people even compare the so-called jhanas that they experience. I got this jhana and that, which, you know, is unlikely because these things are stages of letting go. They're not supposed to embellish the ego, the sense of self, right? So, but what we can do if we don't feel that we're making progress or there's experiences we've yet to have, I stick my hand up, there's plenty of experiences I yet to have. How about you, Aya? Yeah, everybody? So, you're in good company. And we can just say to ourselves, well, it's not that I can't, you know, oh, I'm hopeless, I can't do this. It's I haven't experienced that yet, yet, right? And then I just carry on practicing. I carry carry on putting in the good seeds, planting the seeds in fertile soil and shining the light of kindfulness, the light and the warmth of the sun on those seeds, you know, giving them proper nourishment through your daily practice, giving them um, some kind of protection through your sense restraint, using wisdom, using appropriate attention or wise attention, Yoni So Manisakara, to see what's going on and to avert any potential disaster through the use of unwholesome thought. And there are so many different ways we can use this sense restraint in our daily life. And I really wanted to bring this up as a practice because sometimes people go to retreat. It's a very popular way to learn meditation and a very effective, powerful way. Because on retreat, your sila, your virtue, is pretty much packed. You know, there's not a lot you can really do to blow it <laughs> unless you start to engage in speech and, you know, it becomes slightly unwholesome. You're really quite safe on retreat. So it's a powerful container for practice. But then we often go back into our busy lives and it can be the complete opposite situation where you have a lot of sense input and a lot of perhaps people around you that don't follow the path and maybe don't even follow the basic precepts or um, principles of virtue, training in virtue. So what do we do? We get bombarded. 
And sometimes that's because we come out of our practice without guarding our senses. We forget that now there's still an object in front of us. It's a little bit further away. And so there's more space between us and that object. But in that space, we can still have an appropriate response. So what are we putting in that space? How are we um, reacting to those sights, sounds, smells, tastes, touches that come into our mind? And in that place, in that space, we can actually, um, first of all, notice the reaction and see if we can undermine that by using thought and attention in a skillful way. Sometimes that means not watching the news, right? I mean, sometimes the news is full of fear and um, it's intentional, actually, to make people feel hopeless and helpless and not to take action where they still could. And if you notice that your mind is just getting dragged down by that, then it's okay to actually turn it off. We don't have to watch it and see the reactivity arising. You know, well, I should be equanimous. Sometimes it's just too much. And there's a place in the suttas as well for actually reducing the sense impact. And I can certainly say after teaching a retreat or um, even developing more contentment inside, that I need less and less sensory stimulation. The kind of happiness we normally um, describe as happiness is actually uh, the happiness of the senses, of sense desire. You know, pleasant sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, and thoughts sometimes. Um, but actually, when we grow an inner happiness and contentment and an equanimity, yeah, contentment and equanimity are very close then we rely on the senses less and less. And we actually find more pleasure in turning those senses down, becoming quiet, becoming cool inside, and noticing the really simple things, you know, like a beautiful sunrise or a clear blue sky. Or, well, I had a fantastic input this morning, which was Mount Rainier, and I hope I said that right, which was across a lake and absolutely stunning. Actually, not this morning, that was last night. But who needs anything else, you know? Anything else is actually an irritation on the peace and the quiet of the senses and that sense impression. It's just so beautiful. And the more we develop that equanimity, that contentment inside, the less we need to look for stimulation from outside. And if it does come into our senses, we can also notice that it's arising and passing away all the time which was what I wanted to go into mainly today, but as usual, I have too many ideas. So, <laughs> But lastly, and just to uh, give you a chance for some Q&A and to wind it up, um, we can practice with noticing the impermanence of those sense impressions that we experience. And hopefully you had a tiny taste of that in the meditation today. I began my practice in India and Burma with a Burmese tradition uh, that goes back to Ledi Sayadaw through his teachers. Uh, well, I don't know who his teachers were, but from Ledi Sayadaw, who was a monk, uh, through Sayatetji, Sayaji Ubakin, and Goenka, who is still having a lot of centers and courses today. And we would learn to become very sensitive to the changing nature of bodily sensations. And uh, this is a really powerful practice when you can go quite deeply with that to have a set, build a sense of equanimity, a really strong equanimity that means you can stay with unpleasant sensations as well as pleasant for hours and hours at a time. And the important thing there really is to see that these things are constantly changing and that it's our reaction to those feelings that um, cause our likes and dislikes. We're not actually reacting to anything outside. We're reacting to something we experience internally. And this is so empowering because it means the job that we have to do is an inner job. Yeah, We don't have to fix other people. We don't even have to fix ourselves. If we can just work on our reactivity at the level of feelings, sensations, vedana, then we can put some of these fires right out. You know, they don't even start up in the first place if you really have that equanimous mind. But I think one thing that was lacking for me was being able to discern the different types of input at each sense door. And this is very conducive, not only to the practice of impermanence, the perception of impermanence, but also to the practice of non-self. 
because whatever we think we are is really, and whatever we think the world is, is really just one of these senses, and they're all completely separate. They arise separately at such lightning speed that we can't notice that. We can think that we're hearing and seeing at the same time, but actually, if we go really deep in our practice, we can see that eye consciousness arises, disappears. Mind consciousness arises, knows that it has seen then sound consciousness might arise, a moment of sound consciousness followed by a moment of mind consciousness that knows that it has heard. Okay, this sounds a bit technical maybe, but the point of this is that we start to see experience as a process, not as something solid and fixed, not as something with any substance, and certainly not anything we can call me, mine, or a self. It's also not something we can control, and I think for me this is a great relief you know, that everything is out of control. And we can have a good attitude to it. We can make good karma by the way that we respond. So rather than waste our energy on fixing up everything outside, we can start to look inside at our reactions to life and start to break it down a little bit, perhaps into these six senses, into, you know, the arising and passing away of every experience. And I think this is a really powerful way to practice equanimity and to build that equanimity up in our daily life and in our sitting practice until eventually we can also experience deeper states of samadhi, born of insight, and really purify our loving kindness, our compassion, and our sympathetic joy. So the whole path kind of comes together and any of these qualities could be taken and woven into a Dhamma talk to include the whole path. But I would like to encourage today the practice of equanimity in these ways as a complement to your ongoing practice and particularly this practice of guarding the senses. It's another way of purifying your virtue that can really help with your sitting practice too. And just to leave you with a simile uh, that I think it was my teacher Ujagara told me this. He said it's like, um, you know, when people come from a busy life and they go into a meditation retreat, it's like you sit down on the cushion, close your eyes, and all this junk falls out in front of you. It's like you've stuffed all your clothes and dirty ones and even things that are not clothes and shouldn't be in that cupboard at all. You've stuffed them all into these shelves, you know, and you didn't bother to organize them or sort them out. The dirty stuff's on top of the clean stuff. Nothing's folded, it's a big mess, there's dust, maybe there's mice, and you open that cupboard and bang, it falls out. <laughs> Is that how it feels sometimes when you go on retreat? <laughs> it was how my first retreat was. I even thought I was hallucinating sometimes. There were so many impressions coming to mind. But with the sense restraint, we kind of order our mind during the day and we nip things in the bud. So if we have a potential animosity arising, we deal with it. You know, even in the suttas, it says if we have aversion arising to a person, we should develop loving kindness to them first, to that person first, and then spread it to the whole world. So we don't let things fester. We don't let resentments build up. You know, we learn to regard people, situations, ourselves with kind eyes, with equanimous eyes. And then when we go to our retreat, you know, we sit down and sure, the mind's still busy, but you open up the cupboard of your mind and you go, oh, okay, here's the wisdom shelf. Ah, a bit more mindfulness from over here. Maybe a bit of loving kindness. That's on the top shelf. I washed those things yesterday. And you know where you can find your tools, you know. It doesn't overwhelm you. And we, be, we become able to apply the appropriate tool for the situation, the mental state that's arisen right now. So try and keep your minds clean and tidy using sense restraint and uh, I wish you well with your practice of equanimity too. So. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Anumodami. We've been trying to get our sadhus more sparkly, but I, I think it sounded... <laughs> we'll do that at the end then. Good deal. All right, sparkly sadhus. I, thank you. Um, <laughs> we, uh, those who want to ask questions, we have about 10 minutes or mm. 12, um, maybe a bit longer. We have 20 minutes. That being said, if you 
need to get up um, before then, please, it's okay. We'll run a little over time. Um, just raise your hand and we'll run a mic over to you. If you're on Zoom, feel free to raise your electronic hand and we'll call on you. And um, Venerable Chen did just a wonderful teaching and the end reminded me of a Polish proverb I heard recently, um, not my circus, not my monkeys, <laughs> about <laughs> not appropriating the sense doors. So I thought that was quite nice good. One. Thanks. Yeah. Actually, that's an interesting one because there's a lovely simile that I had all sorts of ideas for what I'd bring up. But there's one where the Buddha says it's like um, there's a pole and around this pole are tied like, I think, five different animals. I think the pole's the mind, I'm not sure. And they're all on a leash and there's a monkey going this way, there's a rabbit going this way, there's a fox pulling this way. They're all pulling in different directions. So yeah, they are like circus monkeys and wolves, etc. Okay, so... Um, I would like to give you the opportunity to ask anything on any subject that you wish, and it can be um, about equanimity or not, or anything at all. And of course, if people need to leave, that's perfectly fine. And please don't be shy. Is this on? Yeah. Um, so you were speaking about equanimity and about people as sort of like saying, may I be filled with equanimity may I be filled with loving kindness, sort of as kind of a mantra practice, um, and how that can sometimes turn into kind of begging a little bit. And I was, my question was, what if we change the language of the chant from may I be to I am filled with equanimity? Yeah, thanks. Um, well, firstly, I wouldn't necessarily suggest the words may I be filled with loving kindness or may I be filled with equanimity. That's not really the words that are usually used in loving kindness practice. We choose phrases that are more like benevolent wishes for another or for ourselves. So we have to be really careful that these phrases don't become... Um, that they're not after any result. So if we say, may I be filled with whatever, it's a kind of desire. It's close to desire. So when we say, may you be happy, may you be well, it's not a desire, it's actually a wish. It's just expressing like goodwill, good feeling towards another person. So for example, on my retreat, somebody said, oh, thanks for letting us adapt the phrases. I started saying, may my mind settle at least just a little bit. <laughs> but can you see how this has now gone into a kind of demand? So loving kindness is really, may I be happy no matter what. May I be happy even if I'm not filled with loving kindness. May I be happy even if I'm grumpy, even if, may I still be well, may I, may I still um, develop my practice. I mean, we don't really say that actually. May I be well, may I be safe, may I be happy. So that's the kind of thing we normally use. And I think it's different from saying, I am, because that's more like an affirmation. This is more of a wish. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, in the end, the phrases themselves are not the loving kindness. The phrases are just directing the mind. They're kind of like pointers in the direction of loving kindness. And the loving kindness is actually the response that arises um, in relation to those phrases. And we can actually measure whether the phrases are helpful or not a little bit by the response that arises, because each one will have a slightly different um, hue or tone. Does that make sense? Yeah. Hi. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm very interested in hearing thoughts around um, the Mountain Sutta and, you know, the broader question of it, whether the Buddha was referring to um, the winds as being the internal greed, hatred, and delusion buffeting the mountain, and yet the mountain remains, or whether the winds were more the worldly winds, the sense doors, including the mind, and the non-arising of greed, hatred, and delusion, and perhaps the arising of wholesome qualities instead, is the mountain that remains. Right, right. I think it's the latter. 
<laughs> that's my sense, because although it doesn't go into that detail in that particular sutta, if you look at the Aditta Parayaya Sutta, which is the one about the senses being on fire, it says that um, the eye, the forms, the contact, the feeling that arises as a result of that contact, the whole lot, and the eye consciousness as well. So it's the whole lot is burning. But it's burning with greed, hatred, and delusion, and all those other things. Even if greed, hatred, and delusion is overcome, it will still be burning with old age, sickness, and death. It won't be as much suffering, but my understanding of the Buddha's teachings is that this whole realm is suffering. <laughs> That's Thank a pretty you. direct answer, but... Yeah, but there's obviously a lot we can do by uprooting these defilements, and the result of that is that we leave this world, right? That is the end of samsara. Once greed, hate, and delusion are uprooted, then that is one of the definitions of nibbana, and that's why it's the highest happiness. So we have to kind of take that on faith a little bit, and also by seeing that our experience in the world is less suffering increasingly by degrees, the more we can undermine these root poisons of the mind. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Matt, if you could give the mic to Kirk. Matt, if you could give the mic to Kirk so he can out read out the question on Zoom, unless the Zoom person can unmute. Hello, Zoom folks. I didn't know you were there, but it's nice to see you. <laughs> is it a, in the Zoom chat or is it a Zoom person? We can't. Work now. Hmm? Sorry. Please speak, Zoom person. Are they unmuted? Okay, go for it, please. Oh, nope, you're still, you're still, oh. Now my mic is dead. <laughs> uh, go for it, Zoom person. Uh, I think you're still muted, though. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Go for it, yes. Um, so you talk about the sense consciousness being separate and they arise and disappear like momentarily and at one moment you're only conscious of one one sense Is that what you were saying yes uh, not that i've experienced this i have to admit but this is what i understand and what yeah people who have experienced this can break it down to yeah that it's one moment of consciousness arising at a time but in lightning speed, I mean incredibly fast, so that you would need extremely deep samadhi to actually um, see that in practice through experience. Uh, but I think at this point, it's probably enough to notice in an exploration of the senses, firstly, how we're relating to the um, feelings that arise as a result, so to the Vedana that's contingent on that contact, how are we re reacting to the feelings that arise? And also, sometimes it's interesting to explore the difference between the senses, at least between the five senses, it's very clear that the eye can't smell, right? The nose can't see. And just to explore the different nature, like seeing has a certain quality to it, it has a certain feeling tone. And certainly when you practice even with just being aware of physical bodily sensations, at the end of a retreat, you're so sensitive to the physical sensations that you open your eyes. Like, we don't really raise our eyes for long periods, like we would do 45-day retreats and just keep our eyes down. And then the first time I raised my eyes once and saw a tree, I was just flooded with a certain kind of feeling that went all the way through my body. So certainly there's always a corresponding physical feeling to every sense input. And also that's, you know, the mind is aware of it as well, but not actually at the same time afterwards they're all separate so i mean this is kind of yeah beyond the range of most of our experience now but i think very helpful to start getting an understanding of non-self which can undermine craving and this is the point right that we undermine our desire and our attachment to to the world does that make sense yeah i think Ajahn Brahm talked about this in a 
and he said that it's like the little grain of sand on the beach. Yes, exactly. Like grains of sand that you see from a distance and they look like they're all together. But actually, when you go closer, you see they're all separate. And another simile I think that Lady Sayadaw used to use was like pearls on a, a string. And if you cut that string, they all fall off. You know, they look like they're connected, but actually there's this string going through, which might be the defilements, I'm not quite sure. Um, and you cut that and they all fall off. Does that make sense? Ajahn Brahm has another one, which is the fruit salad simile. But that's a bit silly. I sort of said that already anyways. But it's like you have a pear. I don't know what he uses, like a banana for the nose, is it? And an uh, apple for the eye and a cauliflower for the ear, things like that. <laughs> and then the mind is something else. And they all come one by one on the plate. So it's the fruit salad simile. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to ask about the connection between um, equanimity and decisions, as, and specifically, um, does your equanim equanimity practice improve your decisions, or when you have a decision to make, is it a good thing to draw on? That's a great question. So, yeah. Um, I don't have to repeat the questions, right? Yeah, so um, I think that equanimity definitely helps with decision-making. It also helps avoid wrong decision-making or hurried decision-making. Because what I found with making decisions, which I have to do a lot of these days, is um, the most difficult thing is when you're not clear. And it's so tempting sometimes when you're not clear to kind of push yourself to become clear too soon. And I've kind of developed this little motto that when in doubt, don't. So I kind of wait until the confusion or the doubt dissipates a little bit. And the equanimity, of course, is an important factor in helping me wait, but it also kind of speeds it up in a way because um, you're letting the mind just rest for a while and just stand back from the whole thing, get a perspective. I think equanimity is very closely related. I mean, it's actually the word upeka means looking on or looking over. Um, I think pekka means something like looking, and the up means like from above or from a with a perspective. So then we can see the bigger picture. Because when we have a decision, sometimes we're so in the nitty gritty, we just get tangled, and it's so confusing. So I would say equanimity really helps, and also because we're less likely to make decisions based on fear, aversion, desire, etc. So it's always helpful to wait until those um, uh, what's the word? Mm, distortions of the mind unravel a little bit because we never see things clearly with anger. It's like we're wearing red colored glasses, you know, or with craving. We only see, we see things in a distorted way and that's what the hindrances do. They distort reality. So I think equanimity is like a clean glass that you have to look through. So it can be very helpful. Yeah. Thank you. I have a question about what you're up to in England, <laughs> Venerable Chanda. <laughs> That's like putting your own question. Thank you, Ajahn. That was a very good talk. And um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you some of your personal experience. For example, uh, I actually have two questions. First one is uh, how, when you practice, like how, how was your non-self to like reinforce the practice of non-self? How, how did it look like? Another thing is, uh, Let's say, like, as oh, right, yeah, yeah, carry on. Carry as on. human beings, we have like uh, insecurities, or we are like growing old. Sometimes, like, we are thinking that, where is my children? Where is my house? My hair is graying out. I'm getting older. How do you deal with these uh, thoughts? Do you, when you, I, I think like all human beings at some point have it, midlife crisis and all those things. How does, how do you deal with these uh, emotions yeah. and feelings if you have them? Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, actually, as a monastic, I think that the renunciation in and of itself really challenges the sense of self. So when we ordain, when we renounce is a better word, um, 
often the ego kicks up a big fuss. So firstly, I say my practice leading up to that already diminished it to the degree that at least I could ordain without too many kind of um, <laughs> Maras coming in the way. <laughs> because it's really scary for Mara, which is like the personification of uh, actually control. <laughs> Mara is known as the control freak in chief. He's like governing the um, Paranimita, is it Paranimita Vasavati realm, which is like the realm of people or beings that control other people's creations. And it's that kind of Mara that makes you think, no, 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 you better not give this up because who will you be without it, you know? So I think in a way it's the renunciation that makes a big kind of um, confrontation with that force. And then the actual training of living as monastics, we don't get to do what we want. You know, for example, we get sent to places that we might not want to go. <laughs> and uh, that certainly happened to me with being sent to England. I never wanted to go back to England, actually. Sorry, uh, at least there's no English people here, except a British person. <laughs> you're not English. <laughs> I know you're not. <laughs> That's why I can say it. But they know this in England, too. But... The beauty of that is that your life becomes more about giving. And I think giving and serving, an attitude of serving, is one really beautiful way to undermine the sense of self. Because you realize that you know, you're doing things because they're the right things to do, because there's a need, and it's a response to a need rather than a response to something I want. And I'm sure that as a parent, you do that all the time. So I think there's a lot of room for selflessness anyway in parenting a child, even if that child's 48 years old. Because <laughs> you all know my age anyway. So, <laughs> um, you know, there's a lot of room for that. So I think one way that you can start to um, break through to that is to notice um, what you consider to, that you own. Because understanding that you don't own yourself is very difficult, but you can actually ask yourself, well, what do I actually own? You know, what can I actually control? And then you can start to see that it can't be yours or belong to you because it's not under your control, right? Your kids won't do what you want. <laughs> Unless they really well behave, but they won't always do what you want or even what you expect, you know? They might go a completely different way in life. So you can start to see that things are not under your control. They don't really belong to you. They go according to their nature, not according to your wishes for them. And that's one of the phrases of equanimity, you know. May this person be happy, but, you know, whatever my wish for them, they will have to travel according to their own um, causes, karma, you know, whatever decisions they make, whatever influences are around them, are not according to my wishes for them. And I guess another way that I think is a really powerful practice that helps me get closer to the understanding of non-self is to allow meditation to become a natural process and to rather see it not as something I can or can't do, but something that I um, that is conditioned. And I have the ability to put good conditions in place for meditation to deepen. So those conditions are virtue, sense restraint, you know, um, giving, dana, sila, you know, these are all prerequisites for meditation. And then when we actually practice, setting an intention perhaps in the beginning, but then trying to stand back and allow an, um, a process to unfold. And when we do that, we see that sometimes, again, the sense of self gets a little bit frazzled because it wants to know what's going to happen next or it wants to be, you know, involved. It feels like it should do this. <laughs> so... Actually, developing inner joy is a really powerful way of overcoming the sense of self because when we have more joy arising in meditation, we dare to let go. Does that make sense? It gives us a sense that we can let go into something beautiful. So it's almost like a trick to get Mara you know, sitting at the back. <laughs> Venerable, can we ask about what you're doing in England? <laughs> <laughs> sure. So, um, yeah, I didn't really get to introduce myself because um, Ajahn made a beautiful introduction, and these are always like the picture perfect written on an, uh, uh, you know, it was actually amazingly accurate, but it's a story, isn't it? It's from the website, but you'd memorized it. That's impressive. <laughs> So, yeah, um, what I'm doing in England is the culmination of, I guess, 
many years of monastic life. Now I've been ordained 18 years, but um, I think in the beginning, it took me 10 years to actually find a place to ordain, and I was cultivating my practice mostly in India and Burma and Asia, um, looking for opportunities which were very hard to find. So that already sort of informed me that it's not easy for women, right, to find a, a place in conducive conditions. But then when I had actually found the place, it was so such a golden era of my monastic life. I felt that this was it. I'd stay there forever and continue to practice with my teacher who gave me all the conditions I needed to cultivate the path. So the idea of bhikkhuni ordination was not really a, a, a alive in me because it didn't need to be. I had all the conditions. I was essentially um, living the holy life. You know, When you renounce as a woman or as anyone, you don't half renounce. It's not like, well, I'll renounce a little bit, but not everything. No, you renounce everything. You know, you renounce, in my case, my home country. Um, you renounce everything your family expected you to do, unless they expected you to be a Buddhist nun, which is not likely if they're white. Um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, you know... Uh, your comfort zones, um, the food that you're used to, a bed. I renounced a bed. I renounced my health unintentionally, but I was willing to do that for the sake of uh, being in that place. And after a while, my health deteriorated to such an extent that I had no choice but to leave, and I had to find other suitable conditions, which was incredibly difficult. And from 2010 until now, I've, st I've, I've been doing that, essentially and trying to practice as best I can in the conditions I have from time to time, but nothing like the conditions of a settled, um, conducive monastic life, where there's, you know, dana available every day for food and a place to sleep, etc. So I spent a couple of years as an itinerant nun in Europe, and actually Amavati, I met you there at that time. I, I remember that, because I was impressed. <laughs> 2009, and uh, <laughs> it was in 2009. Uh, I still went back to Burma after that. I wasn't willing to give up on, on my teacher and my training conditions there. Um, but yeah, for those two years, I kind of stayed with anyone who would have me and practiced and uh, still could handle money, although I didn't have my own money because I was actually on eight precepts, but very much living a renunciate life in the sense I didn't have anything, you know, I didn't have money from the past, so it was dana-based existence. And then finally I got a chance to go to Australia and train with my teacher Ajahn Brahm, um, who I was attracted to through the Dhamma, not really through the bikini thing. I came to know about that afterwards. And of course, as any aspiring renunciate would, if you're given the opportunity to fully go forth and take up the training that the Buddha laid down, why on earth wouldn't you do that? I mean, this is a privilege, this is a blessing, it's the inheritance given by the Buddha, and you just cannot believe the great fortune in having that opportunity today. I mean, it's one of the oldest living traditions and democracies in the world, and you enter a sangha, you enter um, a sangha of monks and nuns who take you in out of compassion. It said, Anukampa. <laughs> Lift me up out of compassion. Anukampa upadaya, you know, lift me up out of compassion at the ordination, and you enter a sangha. And so um, I had that opportunity in 2014. That was many years into my practice life and ordained life, and um, stayed in Perth for a while. And then myself and my teacher came up with a very smart idea <laughs> as a joke to go back to England and start something there. <laughs> and it was a kind of joke. But also, he knew that, obviously, I guess, I wasn't quite at home over there. And that I really wanted him as my teacher and guide. And I was basically willing to serve. I told him that from the outset, do what you want with me, you know. And we had a very good relationship where I felt confident to, that I'd be guided and, and supported in whatever he asked me to do. Um, so I came back to England just to see. And uh, a few people said, well, that would be great. And I told him that. And I said, yeah, but, you know, you'd have to come over and teach and you'd have to be our spiritual advisor. And I know you won't do that. He said, yeah, I will. Yep. All right. Fine. 
And then I thought, oh. <laughs> so then suddenly he's coming and I have nowhere to live, no monastic support whatsoever. I don't even know anyone except my childhood friend and my parents. And they weren't having me. My parents were like, you can't stay here. <laughs> Fair enough. I didn't want to, quite honestly. But <laughs> thank you very much, Mum and Dad, because they are very supportive in other ways. But it wasn't the right context, you know, to stay with them. And uh, and so I had to organize this tour for my teacher and organize all the events. So I thought, well, I guess we need a website and maybe a bank account. And I just started asking around. And we put together a trust, which the following year got registered as a charity. And for the first three or four years, I was living from house to house, really. And people had to be very kind because I'd be on my computer all day long instead of on the meditation cushion, just trying to work out what was needed and how to raise awareness and support and do all the kind of logistics that are needed to set up a trust and all this other stuff. And uh, after a few years, we rented a place in Oxford. Actually, we managed to buy a place last year, a small terraced house. And this year, well, in November, actually, just gone, um, Ajahn Brahm was in England again. He comes every year, and I also spend my uh, vassas, my three months' rains retreats over there. So he was in England, and I just happened to look online, and there was the perfect property that was almost affordable, apart from about eight hundred thousand pounds. <laughs> but I knew, out of searching for these places for the last eight years, that nothing like this was likely to come up again. And it was just outside Oxford City, five miles away, and in a rural setting, with the kind of floor plan that I'd learned that would, be, that would work. So it has a separate living room, dining room, and a drawing room, which can be used for a meditation hall. And about five bedrooms and an acre of land, which here is like this hall, I suppose. <laughs> but in England, that's quite a lot. And um, it's surrounded by trees. And so I just phoned them up immediately and said, can we come and see it? And myself and Ajahn both managed to see it. And we just thought, yeah, we should go for it. And we managed to get a big loan from uh, somewhere. <laughs> I'm not supposed to say. But what really struck me and inspired me so much was that we also got about 900,000 offers of loans from individuals around the world, all of whom I knew. In other words, they'd come to the project, not because of Ajahn Brahm, but through our teachings. And I realized, oh my goodness, things have really shifted. Things have really developed, and there's so much goodwill. And even though I don't see it in my daily life, like there's no assemblies like this. I mean, if I give a talk somewhere, it's like three people. If I would organize it myself in Oxford, it'd be like three people, right? Because it's such a secularized country. Um, and not very much interest, actually, for bhikkhunis, not even much support, right? The main sangha there don't actually support bhikkhunis. So that has a big impact on the amount of support that comes along, and we have to cultivate it through our own efforts from scratch. But the fact that all these people, mostly who'd been with me through the COVID period and coming to all the online things that we did, were so dedicated to offer their personal, you know, loans was just mind-blowing and we realized yeah everything's lined up we've we've really got a chance here and um yeah we didn't take those personal loans but um we got another loan from our fellow brother organization or sister organization and uh and we made an offer and two days after i get back on the 22nd of march we're moving in <laughs> so it's Thank you. It's a bit surreal. It's been a surreal time. November, December were fine because I was just literally high on a wave of inspiration. And after that, I crashed. I really crashed. And it was just, it's been so intense and such a lot of work. Um, but we're nearly there. And so this trip is almost like a, a little honeymoon break or something. And a little bit wild before going back and moving in the very next day. So, um Hopefully, this is going to be something that will serve many people and give women um, an opportunity to take the full ordination. And I think what's needed more than anything for 
everybody in the Buddhist community is to see themselves represented, to see a person that looks like them or sounds like them or has at least a similar, you know, similar background. And this is why we need diversity as well. So we're very, very supportive of, you know, people from the LGBTQIA plus communities, black folks, brown folks, yellow folks, whatever folks, everybody, transgender people are welcome. And um, because I know what it's like to be marginalized now, you know, I hadn't really got that direct experience before, but I never want to recreate those systems for anyone else. And it's a work in progress. I mean, I'm sure I'll make mistakes, but I feel we're doing this together as a community that's off on the right footing with a lot of dedication, a lot of diversity, and hopefully um, people that don't yet even know that monastic life could be a possibility will find out that it is. And this is what gives me the biggest joy because I've experienced and received so much and I just want other people to have an easier time and to experience the benefits. So, and also, lastly, to say, for the sake of all the monastics here, you're very blessed to have monastics in your immediate environment because just like a retreat center has its purpose, daily life has to be lived. <laughs> We need places that we can go and bridge the two. We need places we can go and practice the whole Eightfold Path. And a monastery is that place. A monastery is somewhere that you can meet spiritual friends. You can develop your virtue in action through service. And you can also have times of solitude to practice. So you can develop the whole Eightfold Path in a monastery. And this really starts to create a powerful vehicle for liberation because the practice has to be integrated. So this is what I hope to do, and I think what everybody over here is hoping to do, and I think there'll be some wonderful monasteries here. And we need community, you know, we need each other. These are times when there's a lot of isolation, a lot of fragmentation in our societies, divisions, etc. And we need places that we can come together with like-minded people and feel more confident and assured that our lives are aligned with our values and that there's a meaning to that, you know, that matters and that really contributes a lot to the society that we live in. So 